I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my statutory interpretation and regulation class, or leg reg, about the case McBoyle versus United States, an old U.S. Supreme Court case from 1931 about the canons of construction. And so what we're going to be talking about, and this is the first case in the chapter. It's a very short opinion. It's really short on facts. You have to really go get the circuit court opinion to get the facts, is these sort of traditional rules of thumb for interpreting statutes and understanding what statutory language means. Statutes have inherent ambiguity sometimes built in. There's certain features of um, legislative drafting that are very common and courts have developed ways of sort of taking that to a higher level of abstraction to help um, decipher meaning and unpack how they should apply the statute. And this is an early example from Justice Holmes. So let's look at what happens in this case. Uh, McBoyle's conviction was for a violation of the National, N National Motor Vehicle Theft Act. Um, and he committed this crime in the Roaring Twenties in 1926. He arranged to have a plane stolen and then flown from Ottawa, Illinois to Guimon, Oklahoma. And he and his accomplice, Lacey, later turned on each other and ended up testifying against each other at trial. Now, McBoyle himself operated a small airport in Galena, Illinois. And uh, in 1926, he had this pilot that he had employed named Lacey, who he paid to go steal a Waco aircraft from an airfield in um, Ottawa, Illinois, another place in his same state. This was a brand new plane. And Waco at the time, uh, those were great planes for, uh, for the day. So the pilot did so, and he flew it back to McBoyle's little airstrip in Galena. And McBoyle changed the serial number. He painted over uh, the original one. And then he had his pilot fly the plane uh, down to Oklahoma, to Guimelan, um, leaving it in storage there. He stopped a couple times, and there were telegrams back and forth repeatedly during this uh, trip that were later evidence at trial. Now, the two had planned uh, to sort of switch out the planes. They wanted to get this brand new valuable plane um, back to um, uh, uh, McBoyle and, um, and, and then have a, um, a decoy plane that McBoyle clearly owned but was a lookalike. Uh, replace it. So basically, the pilot started back to Oklahoma with this second airplane that was um, basically supposed to be a fake of the one that had been stolen, but he crashed on the way there in Kansas. He survived this crash and returned to Illinois, worked for McBoyle a couple more months, um, and then they had a falling out. And their telegrams back and forth turned out to be incriminating evidence. Now, that's all we care about with the facts, and we're not really concerned about guilt here. No one questions whether McBoyle is um, a criminal or had criminal intent. And in fact, um, during the cross-examination at trial, it sort of came out that he was involved in a number of other crimes that he wasn't even charged for. But our focus uh, for purposes of our course is the statute and this little section, this definition section, which says the term motor vehicle when used in this section shall include an automobile, an automobile truck, an automobile wagon, a motorcycle, or any other self-propelled vehicle not designed for running on rails. So in that last clause, we know this doesn't apply to trains, right, to rail cars or freight cars. But the question is, does it apply to an airplane? And note that they had charged McBoyle under this federal law. It's possible, it's a little, it's lost to history why he wasn't charged in state court for some sort of state uh, theft, but there was a problem with that because the crime had actually taken place um, in two separate states. And this made it difficult for law enforcement to prove things, to build a case that can create jurisdictional problems um, and so forth. And McBoyle probably knew this ahead of time. That was part of why they planned to have half of the crime um, occur in another state to sort of thwart law enforcement and prosecution effects. So he ends up in federal court under this statute. But as you can see, the statute mostly talks about cars and motorcycles um, and doesn't mention planes. Now, the um, opinion 
observes that although an airplane could be a vehicle in some philosophical sense, uh, for most people in everyday speech, at least at the time, the word vehicle normally suggests something that moves on land, not something that flies in the air. In fact, it says we don't even really use vehicle for watercraft like um, motorboats or uh, steamboats and so forth. Um, uh, the opinion also points out that airplanes were familiar to most Americans by 1919. I have pictured here uh, actually an ad from the manufacturer of the aircraft that was stolen in this case from the time, the Waco aircraft advertising this model of plane. And so uh, when Congress enacted the law, people knew what planes were, but for some reason, the legislative history, the committee reports and the floor debates and so forth never mentioned planes. And so Congress also had said that they were basing this statute, this motor theft statute, on earlier state laws that, and those laws in turn had in, predated the invention of aircraft. So those could not possibly have applied to this case. So uh, the bottom line is the court held that the Vehicle Theft Act did not apply to airplane theft. This means that McBoyle's conviction is going to be reversed and he's gonna go free, even though he clearly <laughs> inspired to steal a plane. Um, and this is true despite the fact that the statute says, or any other self-propelled vehicle. Um, and again, note the decision to prosecute McBoyle under a federal law instead of state law. And think about why we even had a federal, federal vehicle theft law. And the answer, I think, is that in the early 20th century, we started to have a problem that we hadn't had before historically, which is we had trains and cars and trucks, motorized things that could uh, um, allow people to commit crimes across state lines. And this made it uh, and created an opportunity that hadn't been there before to thwart local law enforcement agencies who were not used to cooperating with um, a local police department in another state or a rural area of another state, um, prosecutors who weren't sure who had jurisdiction over the crime, uh, and so forth. And so um, it might even be hard to prove, maybe you had to prove that all of the elements occurred in your state or, uh, and so on. So there was kind of a demand for the Congress to step into this area, actually for crimes, just like the one that occurred in this case. I pulled out a quote from Holmes that really captures his statutory interpretation maneuver here. And this is where we're talking about the canons. And there's an, a Latin or an old French name for this canon that he doesn't use, but he explains the idea. So watch how he explains this. For after including auto, automobile truck, automobile wagon, and motorcycle, the words, or any other self-propelled vehicle not designed for running on rails, still indicate that a vehicle is in the popular sense. That is, a vehicle running on land is the theme. It is a vehicle that runs, not something not commonly called a vehicle that flies. And so notice what we're doing here. We're saying that when you have this rather open-ended catch-all phrase at the end of a series of specific words, that you're supposed to confine the meaning of that phrase or any other self-propelled vehicle to be things that share something in common with everything else on that list, which is that they are motorized land transport. Although, it, by the way, he also brings in another interpretive maneuver, and we're going to call this a substantive canon about the rule of lenity. We'll get to this later in the chapter. Although it is not likely that a criminal will carefully consider the text of the law before he murders or steals, it is reasonable that a fair warning should be given to the world in language that the common world will understand of what the law intends to do if a certain line is passed and to make the warning fair so far as possible, the line should be clear. So this is a type of plain meaning analysis. We're basically saying with criminal statutes, no, we don't think that murderers are going to check the statute ahead of time, but he does, Holmes does believe a lot of other people, uh, law-abiding citizens might check the wording of the law to so that they can conform their behavior to it to make sure when they're considering doing something to figure out if it's illegal or not. And so the law should be clear. And what that means is in practice, when we have a criminal defendant that we should construe ambiguity in favor of the defendant, give the defendant the benefit of the doubt. So where does this leave us? Well, the opinion here applies two canons of construction. 
and that we'll look at in more depth in um, the rest of this chapter. Uh, a semantic canon of construction and specifically a usedom generous. Now the opinion in your casebook does not use that phrase, but the, sort, the circuit court um, opinion really did and uh, in both the majority and the dissent. And also a substantive canon of construction, which is the rule of lenity. Again, Holmes doesn't use the phrase rule of lenity, but he describes the idea that we today would call the rule of lenity, which is that in criminal cases, an ambiguous um, statement, because of concerns about giving fair notice to the public, we should construe ambiguity in favor of defendants. Now, this is how things ended for Mr. McBoyle eventually in 1949, and this is how we're going to end our lecture on McBoyle versus United States.